Hello, good evening. Welcome to Maryland Rice Church. I'm Richard Lewis and tonight we will be continuing our series in the book of Acts. My sermon tonight will be Acts chapter 15 verses 1 to 21 and I will be reading from the ESV version. My sermon tonight is entitled A Stumbling Block to the Gospel. But before we begin, let us just pray first. Father, help me to deliver your word. Help us to have hearts, Lord, that are inclined to you, to hear what you have to say, to desire for what you have to say to us through your word. Speak to us. Holy Spirit, I pray that uh, for everyone that is watching this, you would be um, at work, Lord, um, in bringing about transformation by your spirit and your word. Help me to speak as I should um, and anything that isn't of, of good, Lord, um, that, that people would forget. Um, help me as I bring your word now. And I ask this for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I say, I am reading from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, and I'm reading from the ESV version. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the must custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon had related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that is fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath 
in the synagogues. Let us not, in a spirit of legalism, become a stumbling block between God and our brother or sister in Christ, or those coming to salvation. We have been saved by grace through faith alone. Does anyone remember the dress a few years ago which people would see as different colours? Well, here is another one. Are the t-shirt and the sliders here blue and grey, or are they pink and white? Some people are even saying that they change colour again when they look back later. To me, it looks blue and grey. There is no correct answer here, but this illustrates how two parties can see the same thing in different ways. This is what we have here. We have one truth, but two opinions. The illustration is not perfect because ultimately here in Acts 15, only one party is correct. But it helps us see how two parties can see the same thing, this being salvation, from two different perspectives. They both thought they were correct, and from their positions they were. But the truth here is that the circumcision party, who were a group of Jewish Christians who believed circumcision and the law was still necessary, had not fully understood the gospel and its implications. They couldn't understand how circumcision and the law were no longer necessary for salvation. Circumcision was what was required to belong to the people of God under the Old Covenant. Practically, the implications here were huge for understanding salvation in Christ alone and the future of the church and Gentiles coming into it. This raised issues that needed to be dealt with. It is also likely that this event and the circumcision party mentioned here are the same ones in Galatians 2, though there is some conjecture about this. In this sermon I will be focusing in on these three main points. The first of which is that we are saved through grace by faith alone. The wording used here by the circumcision party in verse 1 was strong. They say that unless you are circumcised, that you cannot be saved. In saying this, they were implying that they should keep the whole Mosaic law because circumcision represents a commitment to uphold the law. They are saying that they must do these things in addition to what Christ has done and contrary to the fact that we are saved by grace alone through faith in Christ Jesus. We are saved by our faith in Christ alone, the faith which God has given us. There is nothing we can do that can save us, nothing. It is finished. They were teaching them this too. They were not just casually sharing this with a few informally. We know from scripture how seriously God treats those who handle his word. They were telling them Unless you do these things, you cannot be saved. Cannot be saved. No man has the authority to say you cannot be saved, except and apart from faith in Jesus. That he came, died for our sins on the cross, was buried, was raised, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Later in verse 5, we see them again when they say we must order them to do this, to order them. Again, this is not in the spirit of God, is it? They had not grasped themselves the gospel. They were still living by the law and not the spirit of the law. It is worth noting that their intent may have been out of genuine zeal for God. It is something we must assess when we, when we face disagreements or misunderstandings. What is the person's intent? Is it out of a genuine but possibly mistaken zeal for the Lord? Or are their motives more sinister? The Westminster Catechism, which is a series of definitive statements written in 1646 to 1647, is a series of questions which look to help us from Scripture 
put into words and explain the things that the Bible teaches in helpful sentences. In asking the question, what is faith in Jesus Christ? It tells us that faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation. As he is offered to us in the gospel. We see this in Ephesians when it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The words of these men would have held great authority to the brothers in Antioch because Judea was where the gospel was first preached and where the original apostles are taught. Indeed, we see their influence in Galatians 2 over Peter and Barnabas on this issue when it came to them eating together with the Gentiles and then acting another way when the circumcision party was present. We also see that in Galatians 2.12, that the circumcision party had come from James. So it is clear that by the time we have reached the point, this point in Acts 15, that both Peter and James had both experienced changes in their understanding and their hearts. This issue needed to be resolved for the sake of the gospel and the unity of the church. This was coming at a crucial time when what was being taught to the early Gentiles coming to faith needed to be correct, and it wasn't. It was anti-gospel, in the sense that they were placing a burden on them that is the opposite of what the gospel has come to bring, which is freedom and an easy yoke. Verse 10 shows the seriousness of what they are doing, that by trying to force the law on the believers, they are testing and making God angry by what they were doing. And that is not a place anyone wants to be. Paul refers to circumcision in Galatians as being a yoke of slavery because we are not able to perfectly keep it. This is in contrast to Jesus who kept the law perfectly and whose yoke is easy and not burdensome. Having looked at how we are saved by grace through faith alone, in response to the circumcision party's claims, we now move to our second point. That God had made no distinction here between the Jews or the Gentiles in receiving salvation and the Holy Spirit. The answer given against the circumcision party in verses 7 and 12, was definitive. Now, in this second gathering, with the whole church present, the case is made. And a spirit is key here in all three arguments. First of all, Peter stands up, and we can break his argument into three sections. Peter's argument to them was that, one, if God has not made no, if God has made no distinction to who could receive the Holy Spirit, then how can we? Two, why are you trying to place a yoke on the Gentiles that neither us nor our fathers could? And if that is the case, then how can you be so presumptuous in testing him in light of this fact? And thirdly, that we believe that we, like them, are saved by grace through faith alone in Christ Jesus. In the book, What's So Amazing About Grace?, Philip Yancey recounts this story about C.S. Lewis. During a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any, belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities. Incarnation. Other religions had different versions of God's appearing in human form. Resurrection. Again, other religions had accounts of return from death. The debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. What's the rumpus about? he asked and heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. 
Lewis responded, Oh, that's easy. It's grace. After some discussion, the conferees had to agree. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, seems to go against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhists' eightfold path, the Hindus', Hindus doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant and Muslims' code of law, each of these offer a way to earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. Verse 8 says that they received the Spirit without any distinction. This is because they were saved by grace alone and not by obeying the law. God here is making no distinction between the Jew or Gentile. If anyone had the right to feel superior, it was the Jewish people. And so those of you who may feel inferior for whatever reason tonight, this is saying that God makes no distinction we are all equal in Christ and of infinite worth in and through him. This is what God says in his word and it is true regardless of how you may feel. God cleanses their hearts by faith. God does not make some cleaner than others. When God fills us by his spirit and cleanses our hearts, it is, it is in the same way as anyone else. We are just all at different points in being sanctified and made clean. The point, of course, is that circumcision does not save anyone. Obeying the law does not save anyone. Only one thing saves you, and that is faith in Jesus, which is only by God's amazing grace. What matters most to God is the cleansing of our hearts not on our observance of outward conformity. Verse 11 is a key statement by Peter in summing this up, when he says, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. We see in verses 7 to 12 also, with Peter and then Paul and Barnabas, how powerful testimony to God's power and glory in our lives can be. The testimony of what God has done in this case is granting salvation to the Gentiles in performing miracles and wonders and of them receiving the Holy Spirit just as they had done. Notice too the vital role played here by the Holy Spirit in this defence. The Spirit was at work here in the Jerusalem Council, in Peter's preaching, in the testimony of all God had done among the Gentiles by the Holy Spirit and from the Holy Spirit inspired prophecies in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is the one who is bringing to pass all that God intends to in the lives of his people and now the inclusion of the Gentiles. In verses 13 to 18, we see how James then linked up what had happened with scripture, how this was a part of God's plan from the start. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God's plan to bring in people from every tribe and tongue and from every nation to bring salvation to the Gentiles. Verse 16 to 18 says, After this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that is fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. James's words from the Old Testament here were to support what Peter had testified to, as being a fulfilment of the Old Testament scriptures. All that we read here in the New Testament is a fulfilment of what has already been told would happen from of old. Acts is largely about the expansion of God's kingdom through the Jews to the Gentiles, and this is all now happening just as God planned long ago. There are two references here from the Old Testament. Amos 9 verses 11 to 12 and an allusion to Isaiah 45 verses 21. It is always important to check the context of any references or allusions from and to the Old Testament. 
The Isaiah illusion, for example, points to the Lord being the maker of all things. The passage within Isaiah 45 is entitled, The Lord, the only Saviour. In referring to Amos, the paragraph is entitled, The Restoration of Israel. It talks about how God will raise in that day the booth or tent of David. This is pointing to Jesus being raised, which inaugurates Jesus' messianic reign and the restoration of Israel. Excuse me. Israel does have a special place among the nations, but this is not one of primary privilege, but of the mission. It is through the Jewish people that God intended to reach and bless the nations. In Acts, we are beginning to see this mission ramped up, the mission and expansion of God bringing salvation to the Gentiles. And this is crucial, what we are reading here, because this is what has led to bringing salvation to us today. If this didn't happen, then we would still be in darkness today. And if this issue hadn't been settled here, then we would still be living under the condemnation of the law, which some continue to try to bring into the church. But every form of legalism is of this same spirit. This was the final word on the matter. And for the average Jew, present day evidence alone would not do. They had to see from the scriptures regarding the Messiah and his reign that what they were hearing was true. Having looked at how God has made no distinction between Jew or Gentile for salvation and the Holy Spirit, we now move to our third and final point. Being a stumbling block to someone's salvation or to someone's understanding of what the gospel means in their lives. We see this principally being played out in the passage in two ways. First in the words and actions of the circumcision party, and then in the decree to the Gentiles regarding their behaviour among those living under the law. The circumcision party were causing a huge problem for those coming to faith in Jesus. They were placing a burden on them which God did not intend to bring, that the Jews themselves could not bear. They were a stumbling block to the full gospel and the freedom in it to live by the Spirit. Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century preacher and pastor, used to visit Monaco. He loved walking around the grounds of the casino of Monte Carlo. Spurgeon thought the lavish gardens were some of the most beautiful in the world. One day, after a conversation with a friend, Spurgeon determined that he would never go back again. The owner of the casino had spoken to his friend, saying, You hardly ever visit my gardens anymore. The friend replied that since he didn't gamble, it would not be fair for him to continue visiting without making a contribution to the casino. The owner encouraged the friend to continue visiting because he would lose customers if the friend quit visiting the gardens. He said there are many people who don't intend to gamble in the casino who feel quite comfortable visiting the gardens. Then from the gardens, it is but a short distance to the gambling tables. You see, when you visit my gardens, you attract other people who eventually become my gambling customers. Spurgeon was concerned and convicted that his actions, even though perfectly innocent, had an influence on others. Will we be a, stumbling, a stepping stone or a stumbling block to Christ? We must use our words and our lives wisely so that we do not become a stumbling block to others. When people first come to faith, we should not be unnecessarily criticising them, bringing them under condemnation. It can take a while before the salvation that they have received in their hearts begins to work its way fully into their lives. Remember also, it is the Holy Spirit which convicts of sin, not us. We also need to set an example with our lives to those young in the faith and to those who do not have it yet either. 
so that we are not a stumbling block to them coming to faith and maturity. When we see, when we are going through difficulty, do people see us leaning on Christ? We must be so careful that we are not getting in the way of God's plans and purposes. That we are not being a stumbling block from someone knowing this freedom by not placing on them a yoke that is not in harmony with the gospel. That we are not teaching people something that will ultimately hinder them coming to God and living in the freedom and truth that the true gospel brings. This brought up relationship issues between the Jews and the Gentiles too. If the Gentiles had to live by their Mosaic law, then they would not have been able to mix within their own Gentile communities. Likewise, if they at this point had no conditions in place at all, it would have offended those who were living, living accordingly under the law. So these conditions were likely put in place for these two reasons. To not offend the Jews and for those and for the Gentiles it would help them be clear about their behaviours also, which were deeply ingrained from idol worship, for example. It also seems that this was a compromise which was reached for the unity of church to prevail. In verses nineteen to twenty one, James's desire was to not burden the Gentiles, but this was also in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Verse 28 says that it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to not lay any greater burden on you than these requirements. 1. To avoid things polluted by idols. To avoid sexual immorality. And thirdly, to avoid meat that had been strangled and still had blood in it. These conditions would mean that Gentiles could have a relationship with Jewish Christians who still upheld the law or found it difficult to accept the things that they had come to know as unclean or offensive to God. This was so not to offend them unnecessarily and so they would not hinder the gospel from reaching them. I believe there is also an element here of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 about being sensitive to our brother and sister if their conscience was weak in any area, so we would not be a stumbling block to them. But also to not offend unbelieving Jews who may come to faith in the future. This also relates to Paul when he speaks of being all things to all men to win the souls for Christ and to being under the law for those living under the law even though he knew the freedom they had in Christ. The question could be asked, why did some Jewish believers continue in keeping the law? The point here is that it isn't keeping the law that saves you. So as long as they are not observing the law in order to be saved, then this would have been okay. In Christ, they are free to observe it or not, as long as it isn't to be saved. The pressure and environment of the time may have through habit or custom also led to them to continue with many aspects of the law on this basis. Having looked at how we have been saved by grace through faith alone, how God now makes no distinction between Jew or Gentile and to be cautious about becoming a stumbling block to the gospel, we come to our application. Firstly, we can ask ourselves before we speak or act, is this going to help this person to know or draw close to God? To know who he truly is, or will it hinder them from doing so? We can be thinking more before we speak and act. Secondly, we can ask ourselves, are the things we're thinking, feeling or believing ourselves right? Are they in line with what is true of the gospel and of who I am in Christ? Are the things I've been told and have picked up things that are hindering me and from the gospel reaching my own heart? If you're not sure, then why not ask someone if what you are thinking or feeling is correct? We all have blind spots and we need each other to help us to, as we grow and live and walk with God. It is part of why we are made to be in community with each other. 
to help each other. And thirdly, we can remember afresh that we have been saved by grace alone. It is not anything we do. Ask yourself, am I doing things or am I concerned that if I don't do certain things, that this will somehow affect my salvation? We may be either still not grasping this, or maybe we had grasped this, but now we have found ourselves slipping into the trap that a lot of people do in their Christian walk, of our faith being some way reliant on what we do or what we don't do. Let us not, in a spirit of legalism, become a stumbling block between God and our brother or sister in Christ, or those coming to salvation. We have been saved by grace through faith alone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the freedom that comes from your gospel, from your spirit, that we live in that freedom, that we no longer have to try to attain um, living our lives to the law, but that you have fulfilled the law and that we are now living not by the letter of the law, but, but by the spirit of the law. Help us to do this. Would you free us? Lord, I pray that you would bring to our minds now things, Lord, that are not of you that are things that are hindering us from walking in freedom. Um, and Lord, would you just help us to grasp um, and help us, Lord, in what we say and do towards others, be in keeping with that freedom, Lord, that freedom that comes from your grace by faith alone. Help us, Lord, I pray. Help us to not be a stumbling block but to be a stepping stone to you in all that we do and say this week. And I ask this in the name of Jesus, and I ask this for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in tonight um, and for... And I hope that you've been blessed by God's word and that he has been speaking to you. If there is anything that has challenged you, if there is anything you feel God is speaking to you about, um, and for any other reason, if you would like prayer, then do email us at prayer at merlinrisechurch.org.uk and somebody uh, will get back to you. And um, if you leave your contact details, and uh, can pray with you over these things. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you um, in all that you do this week. In Jesus' name.